Welcome to NSTA Podcast. In this segment, Tina Grosser will talk about correlation versus causation. The concept I want to talk about a little bit is correlation versus causation. Um, this is a huge idea and really important in the standards. So listen to the two following statements. There's a pattern between higher rates of ice cream consumption and obesity. There's a different statement. There's a pattern between ice cream consumption and drownings. So for most people, the first one makes sense. And they kind of go, oh, yes, I can see where that, where, you know, ice cream consumption could be a mechanism for obesity. The second one sends them on a search for a mechanism. And in that case, it may be that they're just correlations. And the second one involves realizing that, you know, there may be a third variable called hot weather involved. So there's a, there's a third causal um, link there. So it's, it's the, 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 you know, the first two are just correlational. So the standards are asking you to think about um, evidence that something is causal. So this means focusing on mechanism. And the kind of evidence that you're going to use at different um, points depends upon the discipline. So in the discipline, you know, in, the, in physics often, we might use intervention or experimentation. I'm going to show an example of this from the kindergarten performance expectations in just a moment. Um, but yet, in natural contexts, in, in the biosciences, you know, we, we typically would look for opportunity or natural experiments because we're not necessarily going to intervene to, to create a test, to search for mechanism, to, to move from correlation to causation. So here's, here are some of the kindergarten performance expectations. In the first one, we're asking that students construct an explanation for plants and animals, um, for how plants and animals, including humans, can change their environment while meeting their basic needs. And their clarification statement was an example of a squirrel that digs, digs slash burrows in the ground to hide its food. So there, you're not going to be creating an experiment. You're going to need to observe. And it is going to have that before and after. You know, it wasn't there. It is there now. Or this is, this is what the animal's done. Um, but that's the biological sciences, very different than what you might do for the second example, where they're asking that kids are able to design and conduct investigations to test the idea that some materials can be solid or liquid depending upon temperature. So there, you know, you might talk about what you can put in the freezer and what happens, you know, and, um, manipulating temperature, so you're actually intervening as opposed to observing. And I think for causality, it's really important that we not focus just on the idea that you, know, you have to always be testing something, because often it is this very careful observation and opportunistic um, focus that lets you construct the explanations that are needed for the first one. So what I want to do is also look next at three examples. And these are um, all from the interdependent relationships and ecosystems. And the first one is the one that I just mentioned. The second one is from middle school, using a model to support explanations of the effect of, a resource, of resource availability on organisms and populations of organisms in an ecosystem. And the last one is high school. Evaluate evidence for its merits in supporting the role of group behavior on individual and species chances to survive and reproduce. So let's look at how these three might play out a little bit differently. So here's the kindergarten example. And here, you know, you're focusing on constructing this explanation, on gathering evidence, for the notion that animals can be designers, they can change their environment while meeting their basic needs. So you know, the, the focus here would be more on gathering information. These are things you can see. Um, if you think about the cognitive load in this problem space, it's, it's not, you know, students don't have to imagine non-obvious causes. They can imagine the behavior of the animal fits very much for kindergarten, fits from what they know from their experience about how they behave. Um, so very much a, a appropriate kindergarten example for how you would get to an explanation. But notice you're not, you know, 
intervening. <laughs> I don't think we should go play with the beavers here. It's dangerous. So, you know, the idea here is that you're looking for evidence that supports your explanation. As we go to the middle school example, here the focus is on using a model to support an explanation. And this one specifically focuses on resource availability. The graph that I'm showing you is from a multi-user user virtual environment called EcoMove that my colleague Chris Beatty and um, Sherry Metcalf, Amy Kim Rainen, and Shane Tutwiler and I have created. And this, um, this is a, an environment that students go into and they, it looks very much like a real pond, sounds like a real pond, it doesn't smell like a real pond, and it doesn't squish below your feet like a real pond. But they spend time moving around in this environment, and in that context, they start collecting data because they discover that something's happened. Something's, um, there's sort of a problem to be explained. And in order to explain it and to support their explanation well, they need to think about these different resources and how they're available. So the EcoMove provides different graphing capacities. So this would be an example of the kind of thing you would be doing in middle school where you're supporting the explanation, looking at how these resources have certain kinds of limits and how the limits and, and the ways that these resources change impact populations of organisms. So you can see that the lines correspond, so the, the black one is the largemouth bass population. So what made it look like in high school? So high school, here you're, you're introducing the idea of modeling by varying the inputs, but you also have this concept of probabilistic outcomes. So it's not that there's a cause and an effect with a deterministic relationship. This makes that happen. Instead, behavior, in this instance, group behavior, impacts individuals and it impacts species, but it's, we're looking at both in terms of the outcome, and at the species level, we can say that something is causal even if it didn't impact every fish. So what do I mean by that? So this is a picture of fish schooling, and it comes from the MIT teacher education program, this program to the side here called Big Fish, Little Fish. In Big Fish, Little Fish, the students all get a handheld um, device, and it's a, um, a participatory simulation. So in that, the device has um, information programmed into it, and they are given a role. They're either a big fish or a little fish. And then they can engage in different behaviors to see how their behavior impacts their population data. So the population data would be projected on the board, and everybody would have their handheld device, and some of the, the students would be little fish and some would be big fish, and the little fish, they could school, they could hide, they could try to swim really fast to get away from the students who are big fish. So, and they can experiment with what happens as they shift and change those behaviors. They also have the option in this program to change the assumptions within the model. So the model might assume that if they don't eat after a certain amount of time, they will die and they won't go on to reproduce. But they can change some of those assumptions and they can change the, the um, period you know, for, for which they can survive, et cetera. So here, this is an example of being able to collect evidence and reason about the input and the output in terms of individual and species chances of survival. And it's the statistical probabilistic outcome that matters. So that's an example of how it might look quite different as you go from a kindergarten example where you're really looking at concrete evidence, concrete outcomes, and then you know, moving up to high school where you're actually reasoning probabilistically, not deterministically, not, you know, the beaver built the house, but um, this fish is behaving in this way. And sometimes that will cause them to be eaten, and sometimes it might not because, you know, it's sort of summing across instead. So those are some examples. Um, I'm going to put this slide up only briefly because people were less concerned about this. One of the things that we focus on quite a lot in the classrooms that we work in is creating a language of causality. It's not there. We don't have a rich language of causality in our culture. And um, the language that we have in the classrooms we've worked in have really come from the students. They have um, introduced ideas 
and um, they, you know, they were responsible for the term domino causality. Some of the students modified escalating causality to be spiraling causality to acknowledge the idea that things can spiral up or spiral down. So for all of these, developing an explicit language and a way to discuss the causality um, is an important part of the task. Mm -hmm.